Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our first LinkedIn Live of 2023. Today, we're going to be talking about how we shift towards a fair circular economy and drive social justice alongside environmental protection. I'm Nikki Stones, VP of Marketing at CleanHub, where we're on a mission to prevent 50% of new ocean plastic by 2030. I'm delighted to be joined today by an absolutely fantastic lineup of experts. Zoe Lenkovic, working with the UN Environment Programme, Kate Larson, Human Rights and Sustainability in Supply Chains Advisor, Jabir Karat, Founder and CEO of Greenworms Waste Management, hopefully he's having a few technical issues, and Lakshmi Menon, our very own Head of Impact at CleanHub. Thank you all very much for being here. Do you want to tell, you, tell our guests a little bit about yourselves, Zoe? Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Nikki, and thanks to uh, everyone at Clean Hub for inviting me to join you today. Um, I'm Zoe Lenkovic. I've worked in waste management now for 20 years. Um, the last 10 years of that has been very much in um, lower income countries. So I was a co-founder of Waste Aid. Um, I left there last year and have since been doing some work for the United Nations, as you said, on waste and the sustainable development goals. So getting a, that really big picture um, at the social justice and uh, circular economy area. So yeah, pleased to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. And Kate? Hi, I'm Kate Larson. Thank you so much to everybody who's joined. I um, have been in the sustainability space about 20 years, originally corporate social responsibility. And I lived and worked in China. I speak Chinese um, and Asia for 11 years um, and still do um, some work um, in Asia, but obviously more with Asia through the Clean Hub team these days from the UK. So I've spent a lot of my career going into workplaces, um, leading social audits, beyond audit, worker engagement programs towards decent work and better labor standards, which, and I support Lakshmi and the team in Clean Hub and how they coordinate that across the region and the world, which we'll talk more about soon. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Kate. Um, Jabir, can you hear us okay? Are you with us? Yeah, yeah, I, I can hear you well. I don't know, some technical glitches, yeah. Wonderful. Maybe you you could, well. could you just, uh, maybe you could just do a quick introduction and just let our audience uh, know who you are. Okay, um, I'm, I'm Jabir Karat and um, I run an organization called Green Worms. I'm the CEO and founder. And I have been working in this space uh, uh, for the last eight years. And we were, you know, fortunate to have CleanHub as one of the partner. And um, so, of course, you know, I, I think Kate and all, we, 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 we go to learn a lot of things from people like Kate in terms of improving our processes and systems. And uh, yeah, we are, I'm really excited for this. Um, good to be part of this, uh, you know, session. Thank you very much, be. We're very happy to have you as well. Um, Lakshmi? Hi, hi everyone who's joined uh, this session. I'm very excited to be part of this. I'm Lakshmi, I'm based in India. I work with Clean Hub and I head the impact division of Clean Hub. Um, before I joined Clean Hub, I've been working in waste management for about seven years and I've worked very closely with the entire chain of waste management along with waste pickers um, and informal and formal networks. So I'm very excited to be part of this group. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks, everyone. And, and Lakshmi and Jabir, I do realise it's very late where you are. So special thank you for making the effort to join us right now. Um, and of course, a big welcome to everyone that's actually joining us live or via recording later. Uh, we will have time for questions at the end. So do put them in the chat. I think, again, we might be having a few technical issues with the comments section. But if you just put them at the bottom of the chat, hopefully we will be able to get to them at the end. So in many areas of the world, there's no efficient formal waste management. But there is a strong informal sector that forms the backbone of recyclable waste collection in these countries. This informal sector consists of waste pickers that collect recyclables like aluminium, cardboard, PET, glass, basically any materials which have value and a market. And it's actually because of these waste pickers that a huge amount of recyclables actually make it back into the loop in the first place. Now, it's almost impossible to know the total number of waste pickers worldwide. There are some estimates that suggest maybe 2 million people in Indonesia alone make a living this way. But what we do know is that waste pickers have been marginalised and poorly treated by society for centuries. A large proportion of them are women and children. Many even live on dump sites or in shelters made from the waste they collect. They don't get paid minimum wage. There's no benefits. There's no social insurance. 
So how can we go about tackling the waste crisis while also improving dignity and living standards for people working along the waste streams, especially the lowest paid? And how can businesses, NGOs, policymakers be the change and apply waste management wisdom in sustainable development efforts? Well, thankfully, we have exactly the right people with us today to answer some of these questions. So with that, Kate, perhaps you could kick us off and just give us an overview of the problem as a whole. Why is the global waste crisis a social justice issue? Thanks. I don't think we have all the answers, but we certainly are have a lot of thoughts Lots and of <laughs> um, everybody together has the answers, everyone else on, on this call um, and listening and working on the issues. So, um, look, plastic, plastic waste in particular being almost one of the worst types of waste before other hazardous waste, it impacts the poorest the most. It, it kills fish that communities could live off, that, that especially poorer communities are more reliant on. Wealthier people, you know, ourselves and, and others far wealthier than us, have the option to source foods from anywhere, to travel to a cleaner beach, to go somewhere cleaner. But poorer people don't. And, and that impacts livelihoods, that impacts wellness and health. It kills wildlife that feeds into ecosystems that people live off for their food, let alone the climate justice, climate change aspect as well of the production of plastic, if it's not recycled, coming from the oil and gas industry, essentially, and supporting the oil and gas industry, which we know then leads to uh, raised sea levels, which we already see impacting villages in Bangladesh of many of the poorest. So... Um, social justice and why is this urgently needed in the waste management sector? Well, you touched on this, Nikki, that plastic is, is you said it's uh, becoming a value item, but actually the reality that, that we also work with is that plastic that's not often paid for. And that's what Clean Hub helps to be part of the solution to. And the reality is that, yes, plastic has value, for recycling, um, but not often enough is that recognized. And that's what we're here today to be part of the solution around. But as you touched on, also the fact that those people who help um, to create that process of bringing plastic back into a recycling circle, that, that they uh, receive benefits as well. And so at the moment, there's not much money in it, actually, in, in plastic recycling. So therefore, and here's where the social justice comes in, people can't get paid much to be part of that system unless partners like Clean Hub come in to help support those organizations like Jabir's Greenworms here who are doing that good work. And so what we need most of all is more laws and enforcement requiring business to buy only recycled plastic, not virgin, to drive up demand and increase prices to the recycled plastic industry. And that can help increase wages and, and conditions uh, for workers in the system. But for now, we don't have that. And that's why we're talking about the solutions at play and, and, and also to all advocate and influence towards that bigger solution in the next few years as well. Yeah, thank you, Kate. And and I guess, I mean, you touched on the fact, you know, of the conditions and sort of not, you know, the the the, the pay and things. I mean, maybe you could just tell us a little bit more about the challenges actually that do exist for these waste pickers today and that do need addressing. So it's not working in Facebook. It's not even working in a call center in India. You know, dirty, dangerous and demeaning. Um, this is what waste work has been considered historically. It still is. Um, there's actually a lot of handwork. I was on a site in Indonesia a few weeks ago, one of Clean Hub's partners, um, where, look, they're, they're making their efforts on safety and hygiene, and they're taking guidance that um, Lakshmi and her colleague in India have been guiding um, with the support of myself and experts in the background. But the reality is, you know, waste is dirty. And so there's that impact, there's the health safety impact. And then as I said, you know, this industry doesn't yet have a lot of money until we all, as the bigger industry, the brand world behind it, push that money down. And so people, um, historically, it was a very informal industry as well. So they didn't have a lot of paperwork, the small sites, just not big factories like I've been in with a thousand workers or 5,000, with little sites with 10, 20, 30, 40 workers. So, you know, they don't have sophisticated human resources management to start with before we come in. And that can mean sometimes they're not aware of minimum wage laws or of social insurance, and therefore workers won't receive that before 
for Lakshmi and colleagues get out in the field and, and are engaging sites. So that's just the nature of the waste management industry, that there's these fantastic scrappy entrepreneurs like Jabir who are creating solutions to the plastic waste problem, but they're not human resources experts and they're just trying to get the plastic recycled. And that's why we partner together on that balance with the, the social um, impacts for the people who are getting their hands dirty sorting that, that plastic. Great, thank you. And of course, you know, we also need more Jabirs in this world as well, don't we? I, I've just been in Sierra Leone, actually, and I saw for myself, you know, that actually the, the waste, the, the, the problem with no waste management before the entrepreneurs are coming in and actually putting these business in. And, it, you know, it's it's really quite harrowing to see and the impact on environment and people. Um, thank you, Kate. So I think, you know, I guess obviously as well, social change, it needs to happen at all levels, right? And Zoe, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about how institutions like the UN and the broader global community are actually seeking to address some of the issues that Kate's raised and that we've talked about already. Sure, thank you. Um, so yeah, as I, I and all of the, the points that Kate's raised there are really familiar. Um, you know, very much it is the case that people working with waste are often um, you know, among the most vulnerable in society. Um, but by improving waste management, we do have the potential to bring about um, a vast range of co-benefits. So I've been asked to sort of frame this in terms of sustainable development goals. Um, so that's what I'm going to just run through very, very briefly for you now. So I think, first of all, um, you know, touching on SDG 8, which is very much focused on decent work and economic growth, you know, that is at the heart of what we call a just transition to a circular economy, making sure that it's both the people and planet that are benefiting. Um, but of course, improving waste management, getting that plastic collected, touches on many other aspects of sustainable development. So for example, goal one, which is to end poverty, um, I'm happy to say that these days, um, international best practice is very much focused on integrating waste pickers. So these people at the very beginning of the value chain who are working often in you know, unhygienic conditions and sometimes often very dangerous conditions as well. Um, so in South Africa, the government has produced some excellent guidance on how to manage that transition and, and bring the, the informal waste pickers into a system where they can be, you know, properly valued, given recognition, um, you know, valuing their expertise, because these are the people that, you know, they're working with this stuff day in, day out, they really know what they're talking about. And um, very much as well focused on building on what exists already, rather than trying to introduce a new parallel system, um, and making sure that we're improving people's working conditions and compensating them fairly for their services. So as Kate mentioned, you know, the the value of plastic isn't much at all. Uh, the value is very low compared to um, other materials like metal, for example. Um, so is it really fair to just pay waste pickers for the value of the plastic that they're collecting? Or should we also be paying for their service to society, the hours that, the, you know, the sometimes very long hours that they're working in pretty unpleasant conditions? Um, so in Colombia, the government there has um, taken some, some great steps towards um, enabling waste picker associations to become formalised. So there the government introduced a specific procedure um, for these associations to follow where they set up a website and database of service users. Um, they have to do standardised reporting and submit financial statements. And so far, 700 waste picker associations have become registered on the scheme, um, which is providing better jobs for 57,000 people. And the recycling rate is growing at 5% a month. So we can see when we do incorporate the people that are already working in waste into these formalized systems, there's, there's a lot of benefits there. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit as well about inequalities um, because you know they, they, they come quite a lot, obviously, in the sustainable development goals. Um, and first of all, I'm gonna focus on gender. So women, often become disenfranchised in waste management systems when they're being introduced. So although women have normally the most responsibility for waste management at the domestic level, so you know, buying the shopping and disposing of the rubbish there, once it gets to a community level, they don't tend to have as much influence over the decision making. So there's various approaches being taken now um, by the UN, by other groups to really look at how and why women are disenfranchised in these situations, particularly when formalisation happens, when there's opportunities to, to get better paid jobs, 
um, why aren't the women able to access these jobs? So um, in Sri Lanka, the UN has been promoting women's engagement in waste management at local government level, making sure they have a seat at the table and are able to influence these broader decisions that affect all of the community. Um, in Jordan, UNDP has been training community-based organisations of women in all sorts of, um, you know, recycling, circular economy enterprises. So they can, they're running their own businesses now. So they're not only cleaning up, you know, their communities and, and making value from the waste, but they're doing it in a, in a dignified way where they have ownership of that. Um, and finally, in the Philippines, USAID has been running a program called Clean Cities Blue Ocean, um, which is a business incubator business incubator for women led businesses in waste management. Um, and it, it's showing that, you know, by by actually making sure that women are involved, you can get really, really good results. Um, but it's something that does take time and attention and effort and commitment from from local government and from local businesses and so on. Um, Talking as well about inequalities, then in the in a broader sense, I think that uh, you know we need to consider that a just transition to a circular economy is all about reducing inequalities, um, and we need to recognise the huge imbalance of power that's often there between multinational corporations on the one hand who want the materials collected and into their supply chains and want to be doing it the right way, um, and often the very poor people who are doing the hard work of collecting this material. So this comes back to how people are getting paid when they're only paid for the material value of what they collect and not for their service to society. It can be exploitative um, as the world becomes smaller when we're talking about waste, at least we need to make sure that new models are benefiting people in poverty. That's sustainable development. Um, it's a lot more than a narrow focus on carbon emissions. It's about the world that we all want to see. Um, and just to, you know, to, to look at some of the systems that are being introduced, like extended producer responsibility systems, WIEGO, for example, big international organisation, are doing some really good work making sure that waste pickers aren't disenfranchised when extended producer responsibility systems are set up. Um, and there's also some great work being done. Um, there's some principles for corporate engagement on human rights with the informal sector, uh, which was published by Shift last year and, um, and has provided the basis for a new fair circularity initiative, which um, you know, some of the big brands are involved with, and that's being convened by, by Tier Fund. So um, that's kind of what's going on. I would just add, finally, obviously, partnerships for the goals is, is what we're talking about very much and how we can work together to make the whole system better for everyone. Um, and some of the best models that I've seen are when the public, private and community sectors all work together. So, for example, there's a city in the Philippines called San Fernando, where which has now pretty much become a zero waste city. Um, and that has you know, great leadership from local government, which provides the framework, you know, a solid framework for the private sector to get involved in providing infrastructure and then community sector organisations providing the services. Um, and for example, waste advisors in the Netherlands have come up with a brilliant model that also incorporates banks, you know, the finance sector into that to enable small businesses that are locally owned, locally run to actually um, scale up uh, and, and deliver the change that, that they need to see in their own communities. So that's a quick roundup. Um, I'll leave it there, but I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll, we'll discuss some of this further. Thank you. That's that's great. Thank you, Zoe. And, you know, obviously there's a huge amount of work still to do, but it's really encouraging to hear some of these success stories that are happening around the world. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, now, I, I think, you know, let's go from that sort of really, you know, sort of big picture and actually just look at actually, um, you know, how these things, how we go about driving change on the ground. Um, Jabir, you very kindly gave me a tour of the, the Green Worms facility quite recently during my uh, during my time in India. And it was really clear to me that the work that you've been doing to improve working conditions, I mean, actually, you know, the facility is really, it's clean, it's bright, it's light, you've got conveyor belts there, so staff don't have to sit on the floor, there's spaces to take breaks, you know, it really was a, a very pleasant environment to be in. And, and of course, actually, with green worms, and obviously you can talk about this far better than I can, but a lot of the work is there are women, which is, which is great. So that sort of talks to uh, one of the points that, that Zoe mentioned. I'd love to get your perspective, you know, really about how you go about driving that change on the ground. Um, and perhaps a good place to start, actually, would be 
what made you what made you take on this enormous challenge and actually start Greenworms in the first place? Yeah, thanks, Nikki. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. See, first of all, the facility you have seen, I think uh, Kate knows when we started maybe three years ago, maybe the partnership, it was not like that. I remember Kate was calling at me and telling, you know, you're not doing all these things. And I was telling her, you know, uh, in terms of uh, that's something, you know, related to whatever they have mentioned it's already. A lot of people, a lot of multinational companies I used to work with and a lot of partners I work with, they never care about all these things. They always wanted materials to be in a cheaper way. They're all, all you know, they're already, I think these are, CleanUp is one of the only organization my my eight years of journey. Nobody had ever done a social auditing in, in at my organization. Nobody had ever done a social auditing. And she was, you know, I think, uh, so idea is that a lot of people are not willing to pay, uh, you know, and also they don't really care that just, somebody just need the quantity and, you know, someone else wanted the most cheapest way possible. So that's also, you know, uh, so I think cleanup has been very generous in terms of, you know, very upfront in terms of these are the certain things we needed and, you know, uh, we need to upgrade and improvise our operations and other things. But of course, we are happy to pay that extra bucks, whatever, but those basics needs things to be net, met because you know um so uh that just in case that's something you know uh, uh it's it's all evolved over the you know uh, over the over a bit of years and you know and i i must you know take this opportunity to appreciate both you know um uh, lakshmi and kate and all other cleanup team who has you know who has been instrumental in this um yeah um you know okay nikki uh, in terms of uh for me com coming to the sector um uh no, I just wanted to post the college. I want to do something meaningful in life and something in the development sector, you know, and uh, and a profession which which is futuristic and profession which meets, you know, uh, um, like I wanted to do something which makes me happy every day. And uh, that's how I got into this space. And uh, one of the reasons I think uh, we and others has already mentioned uh, this, is an, this is an area in terms of social impacts. There are millions of people who work mostly all the places, even the way even I started, you know. Uh, though, of course, you know, one of the, you know, one of the cause, you know, one of the mission for me was dignify people working with waste. I felt really bad because these are the most, uh, you know, uh, miserable or the, uh, you know, marginalized people of the society. Because in, especially in a country like India, there is a social taboo associated with it. People who come, who people who turns up, it's just not the money factor, you know. Whoever turns up this job, I, I remember one of our wish workers said, you know, don't take my pictures and, you know, use it in my social media. We asked her why. And she, she said, you know, my children's don't like it, you know, because... I'm just coming for this job because of to meet my, you know, uh, bread and butter, my pa my family, others, especially the younger children do not like the way because there was a, there was an issue, you know, I think uh, we were very happy that last time we celebrated the Onam, you know, one of the most famous festival here within the facility, we all had dined, you know, we dined. Uh, you know, yeah, we had lunch together, everything within the, you know, material recovery facility. We wanted to show them that, you know, we do, uh, you know, we do care. And this space is also as much as important for us, you know, like the way they do. So the idea is that, you know, uh, there's a lot of people, uh, you know, turns up these jobs because of the, the, the sheer poverty. When I did a, a kind of assessment of my workers at the facility, 91 percentage of people who comes under below poverty line. 91 percentage uh, you know uh, below poverty lines and some of them you know I, i'll tell you why uh, you know what they used to do in terms of some of them had only 100 working days in a year you know they were earning uh, you know um, like it, it's like uh, you know you can say five you know five dollar per day for 100 working days uh, those kinds of you know sheer poverty people turns up this job so um, yeah uh, so i really wanted you know uh, I really wanted whatever, you know, uh, it goes to them also, the real benefits, because they are the, the real people who just, you know, uh, these are not in a country like India now, it's not technology driven. That's what, you know, one of the, uh, a lot of people, have, you have to literally pick it up with your own hands. So we are giving gloves and all, you know. Um, so uh, that's something we really emphasize it uh, since from the beginning. I really wanted to care these people and contribute, but who will bear the cost of it, you know. And who is willing to pay for these things? And who is demanding as a customer, as a brand? Who is who is really? Who also asked me? You know, suppose Cleanup is asking me. You know, 
okay you must do this then only we will work with you then you know so those kinds of those kinds of enforcement uh, you know or those kinds of conversation is not happening in a lot of places uh, you know uh, so i think that's also very much important you know people should look at the rather than the quality of the waste or the quantity of waste people should look at how well i treat my people you know how how neatly i you know maintain the facility how happy these people are you know all those kind of uh, you know i remember kate was telling me in terms of you don't have a you know uh, you don't have adequate ventilation you know a lot of very very small very minor things which it doesn't cost much but it's all about the attitudes it's all about the you know aspirations yeah uh, yeah it's pretty uh, you know um, yeah it it uh, it was pretty exciting and challenging uh, and uh, we keep growing and we are happy that you know um, so we recently asked how much you know uh, around 6 months back we asked uh, how many people recommend this job to their you know neighbors or other friends or families so actually 89 percentage people said they would recommend this job and um, so when we started this facility uh, we, you know we were struggling to get the workers and also i'll tell you that we started this facility in rural areas rural areas the women workforce are you know women are uh, they are unable to find jobs specifically and uh, we were struggling to get workers initially right now there are you know we have 105 women workers in one facility in the same facility there are 80 people who are waiting for their turn i means they are telling once you expand we need more jobs i means this has become you know one of the uh, you know uh, like people you know started believing that you know this is a good workplace and this you know mostly that's a stable job and social securities and all other you know benefits i think cleanup was also found you know partner in recently we have taken them for a picnic a two days picnic they have never traveled beyond the border you know i means uh, you know uh, so they just wanted to you know take two days off and just enjoy themselves and you know we were you know we took them on a you know a, a small picnic also so just small things which makes their life happy and we do also things you know that's also most important Uh, whenever we discuss about all other aspects of, along with environmental impact and you know uh, uh, results this social and this is very relevant topics or we are discussing today yeah thank you thanks to be i love uh, i love the picnic idea um that's fantastic and as you say i mean all of these little things make a big difference right it's uh, it makes a big difference to the working day and certainly i saw for myself all of the the sort of community and the camaraderie with everybody and the staff were uh, you know there's a there's a there's a really nice atmosphere and and sort of really strong relationships that was really obvious I, I mean, you mentioned Jabir that it's uh, there's been challenges. You know, it's 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 obviously not been an easy road to get to where you are today, and and I and I'm sure there's more challenges ahead. But maybe you can just talk about that a little bit, like what has been difficult and what do you see as the challenges, sort of you know going from where you are today to the next stage. Yeah, um, yeah, um, yeah. I'll tell you one uh, challenges in terms of. Uh, in the past challenges was mostly some of them felt you know wearing a gloves you know they felt you know because they they need to touch the material to identify it so they said they are more con- you know comfortable in terms of without a gloves you know they said we are more faster you know many things so in terms of safety and all the way we are perceiving it some a lot of people do not perceive it in that way so we, when we tell them you need to have you know this is a this is the type of the dust you it comes in the type of material you need to have the a lot of the you know safety specifically a lot of enforcement uh, recurring you know uh, multiple communications and making sure that you know you can't enter without this so this kind of that's one of the past challenges i think to some extent that has been resolved you know uh, especially for the you know mostly for the women workers and all um, yeah one the second challenge in terms of the past i think still to some extent we were able to solve but still a lot of waste which gets mixed up mixed up means uh, household biomedical waste like a syringe you know um, or uh, glass broken glasses so what happens it gets in the bags when they open it up there are some rashes you know uh, like you know small injuries those kinds of things you know uh, so households level they are just mixing still though we are collecting only dry waste specifically we are getting dry waste separately that's for uh, that's a good thing but still household biomedical waste as, as well as the broken glasses but still it's creating you know because they are unable to identify it so the quality of input waste you know especially sanitary waste you know, sanitary napkin you know uh, children or adult diapers especially sanitary napkins are a little you know uh, because all these women workers right uh, uh, so these are some of the things when which comes to them it affects their morale too you know um, so i think uh, the way you know we need the whole a lot of people do not know 
what is the journey of the waste beyond the dustbin right nobody knows what happens beyond the dustbins so i think that's the kind of uh, you know uh, awareness also we were able to create and we are still trying i think to some extent i think 50 to 60 percent we are successful while we compare previous year but still there is a lot of works needs to be done in that and those are the some kind of past challenges and uh, yeah, future uh, f- future things. Um, there are very few people like Lena Bolli who still, you know, uh, who still cares about these things and willing to pay for it. A lot of people still, you know, whoever consumes my, you know, not pay, you know, not paying that sufficient amount to meet some of this cost. So, so I, uh, I'm unable to scale up some of the impact because of you know. Uh, I'm not, you know, this, that's not sufficient. Everybody should come into this, you know, everybody should check these things. Everybody should, you know, comply with these kind of things. Then only, you know, I will be able to meet 100% of, uh, you know, a lot of things or or maybe whenever when new people join, whenever I expand in new areas, that's kind of, you know, uh, that's one of the thing. And second things we are working on, a few things we identified on, uh, how, how can we support this, uh, you know, uh, the workers, children education you know um, some of the education that's something you know we are working on and um, i think uh, lakshmi and team is started working on menstrual hygiene you know uh, menstrual hygiene is another area which we started working on and the third aspects uh, we realize that a lot of people are ending up you know in debt trap for example they are you know a lot of financial literacy they don't have a financial literacy and they are you know uh, borrowing money from a lot of illegal people you know uh, you know all those such places they get trapped whatever they earn you know they pay very high interest rate and they don't know how to calculate these things i mean calculate these things means they don't they take the decisions based on the urgent things so we are also trying to set up some emergency fund you know um, especially for some specific occasion a revolving fund which they need to pay back as a community you know which but they can use it over the period of things so some of the things you know uh, yeah uh, we uh, 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 we we wanted to work on uh, you know along with uh, now i think uh, so we are also trying to you know um, work on suppose a dust level in the facility it's you know, something observed so we are putting a more exhausting facilities and quality of the air also quality of the lighting also though you have said we wanted to you know go for that we are also trying to get certain uh, bureau of standard certifications for our facility so idea is that we really wanted to show off that this is possible you can you know you can take care of your people well at the same time you can keep the facility neat and clean at the same time it can be a profitable you know, or, uh, you know, it can be a good self-sustainable business too. So, uh, though we may not be able to do larger volumes, that's now we are, most, we, we wanted to focus more on quality of whatever we currently do it. You know, uh, that's also I realized rather than scaling it up, you know, let's grow gradually, but it's, it's a good proper quality. I think later on people would fall in line and we'll get opportunity. Yeah. Great, thank you, Jabir. Um, and it does still seem a bit staggering, really, that particularly some of these larger companies are not demanding that some of these things are in place already. But there we are. Um, Kate, um, obviously, you're working with uh, with Clean Hub, with Green Worms, to to put you know to do the social audits and to sort of help along this journey. Can you talk us a little bit, talk us through sort of you know how you go about conducting these social audits with partners that you're working with? So, um, I been with clean hub from the beginning on this um one of the first um and you know i think that says a lot about joel in particular one of the co-founders that he really cared um about the the people who are collecting and sorting the waste from day one and i want to acknowledge that um and he realized that that what we do in other industries applies just as much here, that same responsibility. So Jabir has been um, also quite humble about his Indian colleagues and the expertise on the ground, and which I really want to acknowledge, which is that he keeps saying, Kate, and actually I've just been in the background guiding and setting things up to the standard of a German-based company like Clean Hub working with international brands. But the reality is my colleague Ajay, that in India, who has sign- over 20 years more experience than me, he even earns more money for this than me, as he should, because he's been on the ground. And when Jabir keeps saying, Kate, it was Ajay who found things, who noticed things, who's an expert in the local law, the state law, the national law, the international codes of conduct. And then that just really bearing with people like Jabir on what are the realities and how do we actually um, assess? So 
when Ajay first went on site, what I supported him with is working out with Clean Hub that we would have him visit Jabir's sites with a female assessor as well, because as Jabir, Jabir meant, this is mostly female workers. And they spend a couple of days um, on sites, depending on the size of talking to those workers confidentially, particularly that female interviewer, which these days is Lakshmi, um, who's become an expert now in that, uh, which we've been growing her expertise in over the years. Um, and then assessing the records, acknowledging where, because of these were small sites early in their business growth, that they didn't have certain things or just weren't aware of certain tricky labor safety laws, etc. And And I have these videos of Ajay calling in from the first few days, introducing Jabir and wanting us to help Jabir understand that, yes, you know, as Jabir says, there's all these problems we picked up, but really we trust that um, you've been honest and open and um, true about what the reality is. And our partnership commitment is to do our best to stick with you. And, and I speak for Clean Hub here um, in guiding in what needs to improve in bearing with on tricky aspects on the ground, but still pushing for what needs to be done for workers most urgently. Um, and then acknowledging that with the ongoing partnership you can see here, which is a couple of years now, which is why Jabir is on this call and myself as well. So I think Jabir, we're, we're with Lakshmi <laughs> who's taken over um, and sort of still has Ajay's expertise in the background of that uh, what's happening on the the global standard, the the, the India level standard? Um, so I'm just that's a bit of the practical reality, but also just wanting to give that insight into the approach, because we hear a lot about social audit doesn't work, and it doesn't when a company goes in and has a tick box approach and wants it passed and is not doing that coaching, which Lakshmi does so much of now with Ajay's support based on experience and based on commitment to reward from a buyer like Clean Hub and Clean Hub's customers in the background, and that willingness to understand the realities that that players like Jabir face on the ground and yet keep pushing and rewarding <laughs> as as he's talked about um and then you know track and and acknowledge those impacts for the people on the ground and keep making sure that that improves and you know we're and understand the context that across production and and transportation across so many industries even in the west you know, we're dealing with making sure that minimum wage gets paid, overtime, social insurance, and then towards living wage, and then even, you know, more stable beyond that. And, and that's the context. So I think that's really important for people to understand about the work. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kate. Um, and Lakshmi, so uh, Kate has obviously then been talking sort of a lot about the role that you've been playing uh, in, in, in changing things. Can you talk to us a little bit about how clean, clean we've been working as Clean Hub with Green Worms to, to put in place some of these things? Yeah. Yeah, I just like wanted to like connect multiple points that all of us have been talking because it all makes sense when it comes together, right? Like how Zoe was saying that takes time and the local government is not so enforcing which is the root cause right where uh, organizations are not really able to find those kind of mentors and the laws and the and all the kind of help that another formal system would get um, though this is formal we don't get that much support and uh, in my previous um, experience where I was working like Jabir where I was handling operations I know for uh, for a fact that you're so deep into everyday operations that you can't lift your head and see the larger picture because sometimes you're just at the end of the month, you have to pay so many people and what is more important and the, all these questions really trouble you. So I, I really feel that um, as an organization, when we come in and we say that, okay, these are the gaps that doesn't solve the problem. We have to actually understand, okay, how do we, um, how do we work with this? How do we find these solutions together? So if there is need for like building a policy or setting up a process, what do we prioritize? Because we can't solve everything together in one shot. So to also say that, okay, some of these things, we take a little bit of time, but then we know that we are working towards this improvement and it's a continuous improvement that we work towards. And we prioritize saying that wages is absolutely necessary and then health and safety is absolutely necessary. So some things are very important that we immediately start working on. Uh, and I'm very glad that 
um we have partners and we have a team that understands this so it's not like uh, everybody understands what's really happening and that makes a huge difference otherwise it would just make make life difficult for all of us and we won't be able to do what we are doing right uh, so the pro- approach has been ajay again i have to mention ajay he's he's been an absolute support um the amount of knowledge that he has along with like how you say patient capital like a patient social audit is <laughs> really being with us and sitting through calls and giving that time and expertise including like for example if you want to like build a template of a of a joining form it's really simple you would think that it is oh it's just like a form but then to be able to say there's somebody who's reviewed it and said that I'm capturing all the information um it's very small but then it makes a huge difference to the extent that now every worker who comes into the facility has this form so all the basic details are captured it's a process that is kind of aut- sort of automated uh, that really helps so these are very very small things in which we work but uh, all the different parts that all of you mentioned comes together when we are working um, on each of these things on addressing these gaps um, but with the understanding of the system itself and the challenges that jabir would face and his team would face and a real focus on the rights holder you know lakshmi is yes. mentioning a form but we also do the same on contracts because we know that that gives these women no matter which job they're in or woman or man um their rights to enforce if something happened to them and and or if they need to go to local government for social insurance whatever it may be um the real focus there both on the systems inside the organization but really around helping um the rights holders and ninja beer can sort of relax and know that his people um if he's gone tomorrow for some reason they're looked after by the wider system rather than him on the end of the phone or something yeah no absolutely kate um thank you for that and and i guess then i mean sort of you know and thank you for the summary actually that was really helpful to bring it all together um uh Zoe we we've talked a bit about here I mean Jabir's mentioned it, we've all mentioned it about the fact of actually you know to make this ch- this change happen then we need companies need to be you know they need to be asking for this they need to be investing in this right that that's that's a really po- important part of the puzzle um it seems like not enough are doing that but for those that do want to invest in social change w- what is it that they should be looking out for and and actually are there any pitfalls and things that they need to be mindful of as well with this Sure okay thanks so i've got i've i've put my answer to this in a couple of lists so the first one is looking at potential vulnerabilities um among the people that you are you know if effectively going into business with um and the second is looking at the structure and and how it's been set up so focusing on the vulnerabilities um i say i mean i'm a waste manager so i'm always going to say health and safety is the number one priority um you know are people being provided with appropriate PPE training you know ventilation health insurance health checkups that kind of thing um are people being paid for their service to society over and above the value of the materials they collect um because the values fluctuate and plastic isn't worth very much so we really need to provide assurances to the people doing the labor um is there a strong gender balance how are people's different needs in terms of service provision employment opportunities health protections and so on how are they being met um and how is child labor being eradicated from the supply chain um you know can you look for any loopholes um and and you know you should expect a full and frank discussion with your partner on the ground about what measures are being taken to protect children and other vulnerable people from exploitation So that's the vulnerabilities and then in terms of the structure and this is where you know I've seen the good the bad and the ugly really um so I would I've got a you know a few questions that hopefully would be helpful for people to consider um so first of all is it is it bottom up you know is the project for all the service providing really what the community needs or is it just delivering what donors are looking for um because sometimes they can be you know worlds apart Um and there's plenty of schemes that also effectively cherry pick the more valuable materials and leave the worthless waste to litter the streets and block drains and you know be burnt on dump sites and so on. Um so you know why are we here why are we entering into a partnership like this um is it just to get the to to, to cherry pick those valuable materials or are we here to actually try and do some good in the process and you know it, expand the benefits of this system? and um, to make sure that we're leaving the environment clean. 
um, I would recommend that businesses do their due diligence. Um, so is the municipality involved or at least supportive of the programme? Um, are there existing local initiatives that this project could be competing with or complementing? Um, because we need to really beware of unintended consequences where you can quite easily disenfranchise vulnerable people from their livelihoods um, or distort the market by outcompeting local businesses. Um, then, is it creating long-term positive change for local people? What's the added value for the local community? What happens when the funding ends? Will it be sustainable? Are local people running the programme? Who owns it and who owns the waste? And then finally, how are claims audited and verified? Can you or an auditor visit the site and meet the workers? Um, you know, we've heard from Kate and CleanHub on, uh, on best practice, I would say here, which is really great to see. Um, so I think that, you know, people who are watching this, um, I would recommend giving them a call um, um, because there's plenty to learn from, this, from these guys. They're just doing a great job. So that's, that's it for me. Thanks, Nikki. Thank you, Zoe. And, and we will be doing a write up actually of this event after and it will be available on our blog. So we will make sure we capture all of the questions that Zoe mentioned there, because I think that's really, really useful for, mm -hmm. for any brands uh, and companies out there that, that are listening in. Um, we, we're getting close to we're getting close to time now. So um, I think just to sort of bring things together, um, maybe Lakshmi, we can finish on a, on a positive note here. We've heard a lot about the challenges and a lot of things that are happening, but there's also there's a lot of success stories out there. And, and we've seen this uh, ourselves with, with a lot of the people that we're working with at Greenworms. Maybe you could just share a couple of those with the audience. Yeah, sure. I'll share a couple and I would really invite Jabir as well to share uh couple of success stories. Um, I think personally for me, uh, we work with a small team of collection, uh, waste collection team in Konad Beach and uh, it's a small place in here in Cold Court in Kerala. Uh, and from this past one year, I've been constantly meeting them and you can see the visual difference in, in the way, um, like for example, there is this person, Sabira, who has, when I first met her, her home was really small and like half sheet and stuff like that. But over the period of time, you can see that she is able to like make her home much more sturdier, rebuild it, it's cleaner, and she's more happy. Uh, I, I feel very happy that she's able to do it because more, the one of the biggest things that almost all the workers have said is the, the ability to contribute to the family income. And I think a lot of percentage, I think more than 80% of the workers are contributing to at least half the income. And maybe some are um, a large portion of them are also single mothers, which is another story I wanted to share uh, where um, there is this mom. It's part of also our needs assessment and Jabir can say. Um, so there is this lady who is a single mom and was really proud of coming for the work that she's doing every day because in her um, in a child's school or college that she's studying in, the teachers are really inspired by the work that she's doing. And that makes her really motivated. Uh, because she's able to come here and contribute to this child's education. And that's, I feel very moved with these stories because it's uh, it's not an easy job. And that's, yeah, I, I would really like Jabira as well to like add some stories. He'll have many. Yeah, to bear any, any stories from the ground that you can just share to end just on a positive <laughs> note. <laughs> yeah, uh, I... Uh... See, uh, a couple of things. One, a lot of these people, whoever had joined, none of these people had the social security things, okay? And it's it's right from 100 working days to 300 working days. It's broadly, you know, 100 working days in a year that was their, you know, thing. And it has gone to 300 working days. And none of these people had social security. I think uh, either they even didn't expect that, you know, we even paid some, you know, national holidays and all recently, because they had no, never experience in such kind of, you know, benefits uh, in thing, thing, things. Also, in terms of working hours, you know, it's eight hours in, in India and all. Everybody makes you to work 10 to 12 hours. A lot of things, you know, very, you know, very exactly whatever the law is saying, you know. Um, it's nothing beyond that. And also, um, uh, uh, we had arranged dining area for them, you know, a specific area. Uh, you know, and keeping their, you know, bags and all those kinds of, we even arranged a small pickup van, to, you know, because there was the need to walk around, you know, one kilometer up and down to, you know, to catch the bus. So we arranged a small van to pick them up, you know, that's another, uh, you know, small things we have done. And um, 
uh yeah so all these uh yeah one of the instances i remember um uh, there was a woman who had come to us um her face you know she had some deformities in terms of her face i think some kind of acid attack or some sort of some deformity face and uh, she came with a you know mask we did the mask and for because we were just recruiting people uh, so first thing she asked you know uh, she just removed the mask and said you know am i eligible for this job or will you hire me you know she didn't ask anything else she didn't ask about the wage or she didn't ask about the facilities nothing benefit she just asked because she was refused and she was denied the job in many places you know she she used to work as a housemaid in many places you know there was issues with her only because of her the way she looks you know because of her face and she was denied the job and uh, so uh, we you know i think a lot of people you know we clearly said we, we don't really care about you know how do, how do you look you know in terms of that and when we said yes to her you know the kind of smile uh, and the kind of the joy you know which we felt uh, you know within her those are very you know minor issues as another woman uh, who whose dream was to buy a scooty a scooter you know and uh, as she said because of, because the moment a lot of people these women started earning their power equation in their household has changed back in home the, with their relation with their husband has changed they used to depend anything and everything for their husband and you know right now they are earning they are contributing to the family and uh, she came to me and said you know i i got a scooter now you know because a lot of people started giving me loan and all because you now there is a stable income you know every month you know they can they know that you know you can expect that money and uh, she was so happy that you know, the, the, the kind of money she earned herself and buying the scooter and another um, another just issue uh, Uh, yeah one day i just was at the facility and uh, you know some uh, some drunk guard most of these women husbands and all drunk guards either bedridden i mean mostly you know those kinds of families they comes so one day uh, she was saying you know uh, one person was calling at the facility and making issues the one of the husband of the worker then she was saying you only pay half of the money because actually we used to pay that exactly the amount but uh, she told her you know husband that you know i don't get paid this much in the facility because she wanted to save you know that money for her children and other purposes you know she wanted to hide that money you know uh, uh, from husband that she really earned this much you know she, he was you know i was asking my people you know why didn't we pay this much so they said we do pay men we do pay but she really hides from her husband because she wanted to because all the payments are being transferred to bank account and all everybody has this you know atm cards and all you know recently so the very very you know smaller uh, things you know we get to hear you know we go to the field and you know those are some of the things which actually makes you know people <laughs> i think like shwen always say you know those are you know things which make us on every day you know make waking up every day and you know, starting working on this you know let's come off the driving factors and motivations because of uh, you know these are the real uh, uh, you know people who Uh, you know maybe the bottom of the pyramid uh, you know uh, uh, is a lot of difference in their uh, smaller changes will create yeah yeah no absolutely to be and thank you so much for those because i think it it's it's really important for everyone to remember and anyone listening and for brands and things you know actually when you are investing in in social change when you are investing in environmental programs as long as you're doing it with the right partners then you know it, this really does have an impact not just on the environment but actually on people's lives um and i think that's really important for for all of us to remember and we are all part of the solution we all have a responsibility to bear there um we are i'd said we'd do questions um is but we've had so much to talk about um that we've we've pretty much run out of time actually um i i would say to anyone listening if you've got questions do put them in the chat uh, on linkedin and we'll make sure that it that, that every question can get to the speakers um and that we can answer them and probably we'll end up having to do a follow up of this event at some point in the future um i i would say as well we've got a lovely story of gitu who who works with green worms uh, in in konad beach in kerala which is on our social impact page which is a video of of her personal story and i really would advise anybody to to go and take a look at that um but have some tissues ready because it's uh, it's a bit of a tear jerker but it's lovely um so with that I, i will bring things to a close thank you ever so much to our speakers um thank you yeah thank you for for everything and as i say if you do have any questions then just put them onto the linkedin post and we'll make sure they get answered so thank you all thank you so much thank Thanks you it was lovely thank, thank you. you thank you